All right, Dr. Freeman, we can okay. get Okay, started. let's get started. I think I started the recording. Welcome everybody to the Good Hormone Health webinar on December 6, 2023. Today's topic is entitled Optimal Replacement for Hypopituitism and She-Ends, Oxytocin, Testosterone, Growth Hormone Stimulants, and Beyond. Learn what most endocrinologists don't know about, but will improve your quality of life. The outline for tonight's talk is, uh, first of all, causes of hypopituitism, cortisol, the right and wrong way to give, thyroid optimization, growth hormone, not just for kids, oxytocin, the love hormone, testosterone, not just for men, stimulants to treat pituitary apathy, and learn about common medicine, the common medicine you should never take if you're on growth hormone, and learn how hormones interact. Pituitary hormone replacement, what's the big deal? Pituitary disorders are fairly common, but experts in treating them are not. Many patients with hypopituitism feel like crap with weight gain and fatigue. Small changes in replacement may make a big improvement in symptoms. Many endocrinologists do not understand how to properly replace hormones with pituitarism. They either don't understand or don't believe in monitoring hormone levels. They don't believe that fine tuning makes a difference. And there's a lot, some extras that I practice and um, are based on literature, um, but many endocrinologists don't understand or don't use such as testosterone for women, oxytocin and stimulants. And these make a difference. We simply need to do more. Patients with hypopituitism that receive conventional therapy to have increased mortality. This was published uh, several years ago in many articles. This is suggested, but not uh, proven for sure to be due to growth hormone deficiency. But I think it's also due to many, many other factors that the pituitary makes that are missing patients with hypopituitism. And quality of life was found to be decreased in patients with hypopituitism in several studies. And this is probably due to suboptimal replacement of pituitary hormones. You have the different axes. The most preserved axis is the CRH, ACTH, and cortisol axis. This is the adrenal axis. So cortisol, uh, this axis, ACTH, and cortisol is the last hormone to be affected if you have damage to pituitary. And it's also the one that most likely can recover as your pituitary recovers. The thyroid axis is TRH from the hypothalamus, TSH from the pituitary, and T4 and T3 from the thyroid. This is the next one that's affected. The gonadotropin axis is GnRH in the hypothalamus, LH and FSH in the pituitary, and testosterone and estrogen in the uh, gonads in the women, the ovaries, men, the testes. The growth hormone axis, this is made in the pituitary cells called somanotrophs. GHRH comes to the hypothalamus, growth hormone from the pituitary goes to IGF-1 from the tissues such as liver and muscle. Prolactin is made in the somanotrophs in the pituitary along with growth hormone, and posterior pituitary makes a ADH, or also called AVP, and oxytocin. And we'll talk about all these hormones today. So the hormone that's most affected uh, the easiest is growth hormone. So it's not surprising that somebody's going to be growth hormone deficient with the other hormones preserved. Gonadotropins are next, FSH and LH, TSH is next, ACTH is next. Prolactin is relatively rarely affected, and we don't really, there's not much of a problem with low prolactin other than lack of breastfeeding. And the posterior pituitary hormones, you know, may be fairly well preserved, but it depends on sort of where the damage is in the pituitary. So first of all, you can have causes of um, anywhere in the uh, hypothalamic stalk pituitary axis. And I think in a very important paper I did with Kevin Ewan in 2008, we showed that microadenomas in the pituitary can give hypopituitarism. I'll talk about that study in a second. Um, the pituitary tumors, micro macroadenomas and microadenomas, pituitary surgery, pituitary radiation, Sheehan syndrome, which we'll talk about tonight a lot, and Simmons syndrome, which I just fairly looked up and learned is pituitary apoplexy, but is not due to, um, it, it's, it's, not, it's not due to like at post-pregnancy. It's just the pituitary um, gets, um, has like a mini stroke to it. Hypophysitis is an inflammation of the pituitary. Pituitary can be inflammated with different inflammatory diseases. You can have an empty cell. This is a common cause of hypopituitarism. That's also not widely recognized by many endocrinologists and uh, a radiologist. Malnutrition and critical illness can give hypopituitarism, and head trauma or traumatic brain injury can also do it. In the hypothalamus or the pituitary stalk, the stalk connects the hypothalamus to the pituitary. You can have a craniopharyngioma, you can have a brain tumor, a CNS malignancy, you can have surgery or radiation to the stalk and the hypothalamus. Head trauma and accidents can do it. Infiltrated diseases such as histiocytosis X, hemochromatosis and sarcoidosis can do it. 
infections can do it and drugs such as steroids, dopamine analogs, somatostatin analogs can all cause hypopituitarism. We did a, pub, a pub paper with, with Kevin Yu and we looked at 38 patients with non-secreted pituitary microadenomas. The mean tumor size was 4.2 millimeters. There was a normal serum. They had a normal serum IGF-1, 19% or 50%, 19 patients or 50% of them were found to be growth hormone deficient. They had a higher body mass index than those that passed the growth hormone stimulant GHRH arginine test. At that time, was that's the test we did um, and healthy controls. 19 patients or at least half of them had um, another pituitary def defect beside growth hormone. And we concluded that a substantial number of patients with non-secreting pituitary microadenomas were growth hormone deficient despite normal serum IGF-1 levels and at least had at least one other pituitary hormone defect, suggesting that non-secreting microadenomas may not be clim clinically harmless. So the term incidentaloma is probably not correct because these can affect all hormones and can give hypopituitarism. Um, so the conclusion from our study was that patients with low IGF-1 and microadenomas are even more likely to be growth hormone deficient. Many endocrinologists test for hypopituitarism only if a patient has had prior surgery or radiation, which is not really a good approach. My approach is to take a patient that has fatigue, look at their hormones, especially their IGF-1. Um, and then if they have um, symptoms of hypopituitarism, then we get a pituitary MRI. If the MRI shows a small tumor or a pituitary and the IGF-1 is low, the patient and the patient has stimulation test symptoms of growth hormone deficiency, then we do a growth hormone stimulation test. And this is why I've been able to find growth hormone deficiency and uh, several hundreds of patients, and then they go on growth hormone and most of them do quite well. Traumatic brain injury is another cause of growth hormone deficiency. The symptoms of traumatic brain injury are the symptoms of growth hormone deficiency, fatigue, poor exercise, performance, feeling of isolation, mood changes, lack of motivation, easily irritated, memory and, con and concentration problems. And these uh, occur commonly occur after a head injury, um, some kind of like car accident can often do it. Uh, patients have concussions or knocked out. It's uh, fairly common for these to occur. So what happens is, the, is that when the head goes forward, the pituitary gland remains in place as the head moves forwards, and then it goes backwards within the skull. And this can damage the stretching of the stalk. You can see the micro tears in the pituitary's blood and nerve supply as it goes forward and backward, and this can lead to hypopituitarism. So Sheehan syndrome is postpartum pituitary injury due to massive hemorrhage. And maybe it doesn't have to be so massive, but you have a hemorrhage. Uh, Simmons disease is atrophy or disruption of the glands, uh, <laughs> resulting in hypopituitarism um, without the um, postpartum effect. Traumatic injury results in hemorrhage and a non-pregnant state can also cause partial or complete pituitary failure. The Dahan syndrome, which I haven't heard of before, I did some research on this, is pituitary injury due to severe vas vasospasm without significant hemorrhage. And pituitary apoplexy is infarction of the pituitary adenoma and intermass hemorrhage with resulting injury to the hormone production by the glands. So this is a diagram of Sheehan syndrome. Um, you can see the pituitary up in here, the anterior and posterior pituitary over here. Um, mostly these occur in the anterior pituitary. Um, it's uh, people that have a more fragile blood system. It's thought to be associated with postpartum hemorrhage. The people that have um, um, placenta bleedings and placenta previ, um, they can bleed a lot. And then that um, the pituitary gets big in pregnancy, they increase metabolic demand. And then right when you deliver, the demand lessens. If they have a, a lot of bleeding, they can get, not get um, proper blood flow to the pituitary and they can have um, um, a hypopituitarism resulting. Pituitary necrosis is not associated with pregnancy. It's called Simmons syndrome. The clinical features of Sheehan syndrome are menstrual irregularities, um, or um, either um, almost all of them had that, either amenorrhea, no periods, or oligomenorrhea, uh, absent or sparse pubic hair, axillary hair, weakness and loss of weight, dryness of the skin, failure of lactation, atrophy of the breast, and hypotension, low blood pressure is uh, fairly common. Laboratory symptoms uh, would be, you know, adrenal insufficiency, low ACTH and cortisol, low TSH and free T4, free T3, low LH and FSH, low estrogen, often low prolactin. Again, one of the common symptoms is these uh, patients don't breastfeed and they often get referred by their lactation expert 
who was uh, able to figure out why they're not having uh, um, blood uh, milk production. Um, and um, they often have a headache, visual field problems, you know, um, at low blood pressure and symptoms of the hormone deficiency. Symptoms again are severe headache, hemorrhage, can't lactate, adrenal insufficiency symptoms may be delayed and may recover with time. I had uh, one of my famous patients uh, from New Jersey, you know, she had this for, for a long time and then gradually her hormones recovered and she was able to give birth to a beautiful baby and she's doing quite well. The trick is to replace the hormones as indicated. Sometimes they recover, you need to give less hormones, uh, especially the cortisol can be one of the early hormones to go and then it can recover. We'll start with glucocorticoid insufficiency as that's the uh, most serious one. However, with glucocorticoid insufficiency, you need a significant impairment of pituitary function. So you have to have a lot of your pituitary damage to get that. Um, classically, the pituitary only affects cortisol, not the mineral corticoids. The mineral corticoids are the salt regulating hormones from the adrenals. It can be life-threatening, but most patients do fairly well. They do better if you have glucocorticoid insufficiency on a pituitary basis than on an adrenal basis. And this is partially because the, the, the mineral corticoid, the fludrocortisone, is missing in patients with adrenal insufficiency on an adrenal basis, but not in the pituitary basis. And it's also due because some of the other hormones the pituitary makes sort of uh, allow the uh, uh, inactive cortisone to go to cortisol, and the patients do fairly well. Symptoms would be um, fatigue, lethargy, nauseousness, vomiting, joint pains, abdominal pain, weight loss, low blood sugar, which is not that common in adults, but happens, and low sodium. So what I do, and what I think many people do, is they screen with an ADM cortisol. Um, if it's quite low, if it's less than three, they have glucocorticoid insufficiency. If it's, between, if it's uh, greater than 12, they're not really sick, it's unlikely. And they have this gray zone of three to 12 or so. You could do a cosentropin test. You don't want to do a cosentropin test if it's an acute problem. Um, and they usually need to be formed in places that have expertise to do it. The one hour cosentropin test is the classic test. And this is what I recommend. I recommend the full test, the 250 microgram test. You measure uh, plasma cortisol at zero, 30, and 60 minutes. I think most people, there was a recent article that came out, any value over 16 is normal. I think 20 is too high. Um, if it's less than 10, glucocorticoid replacement is re required. But I think most endocrinologists don't really understand this. If it's sort of between 10 and 16 or so, you may need to replace during stress, but you don't have to replace daily. Glucocorticoids can be detrimental. So I try to be judicious on who I put on them and who I don't, but other patients, they really need it. Um, there are these tests, IDT and materapone tests. Um, I did want to recently have a patient that we did do a materapone test on. It worked fairly well and did diagnose her. So I did want to mention that even I don't do it too often. The ITT or insulin tolerance tests are non-physiological. They can exacerbate adrenal insufficiency. It needs to be supervised by a doctor. You could have um, uh, heart problems. So if you have heart problems, it's probably contraindicated. Um, so I usually don't do that. But I did the materapone test on a patient. There is a, a place called Alliance uh, RX that gives materapone spelled this way, 30 milligrams per kilogram. So the pill is uh, 250 milligrams. So this one patient I did, she got 11 pills. You get 11 deoxycortisol at 8 a.m. This could be drawn at Quest or LabCorp. And then right after that, she takes hydrocortisone, 50 milligrams. And so it's a pretty easy test to do. It can be done as an outpatient. It doesn't need to be due in your office. And um, the 11 deoxycortisol or compound S, um, if it's uh, less than 70, the cortisol level is less than five. It's consistent with adrenal insufficiency on a pituitary basis. How much cortisol replacement should you give? When I was at the NIH, um, a colleague of mine, Esteban, uh, published in JCNM, uh, measured co daily cortisol production with a stable iso cortisol isotope. It was about 10 milligrams per day, 5.7 milligrams per meter squared. And so if you give oral cortisol, uh, you can give 10 to 12 to 15 milligrams per day. So you don't, most people give too much of it. And I think as these, as I've given these talks over the years, endocrinologists are giving less, which is good. And I think for many people, sort of 15 is a reasonable dose, sometimes up to 20, but occasionally people need more. If you give too much glucocorticoids, um, you uh, can get osteoporosis, glucose intolerance, increased infections, all those are bad. If you give the right amount and a person really needs it, it's usually not too well tolerated. There is a circadian rhythm of it, which is why I like, um, Hydrocortisol gives you a mimic the circadian rhythm. The body makes most of the cortisol in the morning, less at night. So I try to do that in my replacement. 
But no matter how you do it, you're not as good as Mother Nature. Um, even you, uh, if you give several doses per day, the body knows when to make cortisol, when to make the right amount, the right time of the day. So glucocorticoids can be dangerous. They can be detrimental. There needs to be a clear indication for treatment. There used to be a concept, maybe it's still gone, talked about a little bit, called adrenal fatigue. I think that's gone out of favor a little bit. There was a study that shows that these people were labeled as adrenal fatigue, have normal hypothalamic due to adrenal access. So uh, usually more alternative doctors would give a lot of hydrocortisone, some supplements. Um, but I think that's becoming less common now. And I think we're really clear who should... Um, that patients, only patients with true adrenal insufficiency should be getting glucocorticoids. Do you have someone unmuted on Facebook? Or do we get a little bit of background? Um, I think it's... Okay, that's better. So most patients are overtreated. The, over, the symptom of overtreatment is easy bruisability, weight gain, and central obesity. Um, the most uh, symptom of inadequate treatment is joint pain. And I like to give most of the cortisol in the morning. I don't give it all. I usually do can do it three times a day, four times a day occasionally. Typical dose might be 10 milligrams in the morning, 2.5 milligrams at noon, 2.5 milligrams at dinner, and 2.5 milligrams at bedtime. I don't give a large dose at nighttime, but I did a study when I was at the NH with adrenal insufficient patients, and they needed a little bit of hydrocortisone before they went to bed to go into deep sleep. So both too little and too much hydrocortisone is bad for sleep because these patients have bad sleep. Um, but uh, I pretty, uh, most patients, many patients need a little bit before they go to bed to sleep well. And that little bit doesn't keep them awake. It actually helps them sleep. Um, there's no studies comparing different treatment regimens. I usually give most in the morning. I aim for 15 to 20 milligrams a day, um, maybe 15 in a woman, 20 in a man, but maybe even less. Um, you could try to decrease it. And then uh, if you get some symptoms, you go back. Um, a small change to make a big difference, especially between this sort of 15 to 25 milligram dose. Um, that uh, little change makes a difference in symptoms. You could increase the dose with illness. Short term, it's better to give more. Long term, it's better to give less. And I sometimes have people take an extra 2.5 or 5 milligrams before heavy exercise. Sometimes if they're traveling, I give it to them. Go on a long airplane, it would be reasonable to take a little extra. Um, if you do give lower doses, you're more likely on the edge of what they need. They're more likely to uh, have a crisis. But, you know, if you can tell people, educate people to updose if they're sick, if they have flu or other illness, they're likely to be okay. Um, you can give them a metallurgrasis. First, they should double their glucocorticoid replacement. They can do a, a actovial with an injection. Um, they can drink a lot of salts and fluids like Gatorade, fludrocortisone, sometimes helpful when they're having um, low, low uh, blood pressure. Lots of nauseous medicines are helpful. Zofran and fenugrin, pain meds, anxiety medicines, Ativan is good to have. Uh, but the patient should not be stoic. And if they really need to, they can go to the emergency room. Although many emergency rooms aren't that helpful and it might be just better to contact me and um, we'll try to up or learn how to updose themselves. One thing that's not done that widely, but I think it's quite helpful is you have 24 hour urine for 17 hydroxy steroids. These are cortisol metabolites. This is a good way to monitor replacement. Uh, the urinary free cortisol tends to be higher during replacement because um, you, if, right if you take your pill of cortisol or hydrocortisone, it's not absorbed in the kidney and it goes out in the urine right then. The 17 hydroxy steroids per day is more integrated throughout the day. Um, and there are other hormones that we'll discuss later that affect glucocorticoid metabolism that are important to consider. Let's switch to central hypothyroidism. Central hypothyroidism is fairly common even with small tumors. The mild cases may, uh, may affect more clinically. And this is more than, than subclinical hypothyroidism due to low thyroid hormones because when you have a thyroid problem, your TSH may go up first, but your T4 and T3 are normal. When you have a, a hypopituitarism, you have a low free T4 in the face of a lowish TSH. So actually the thyroid hormone itself is usually low. The free T4 is often between 0.7 and 1.0. The free T3 is not usually that helpful. Um, you could do some, some different types of tests. TRH tests, for example, it's not really available. So we usually make this diagnosis based on the low free T4 and in the face of sort of a lowish TSH. The signs and symptoms are, are similar to hypothyroidism. Um, what do you treat with central hypothyroidism? Um, you can give levothyroxine, but I find that most patients with central hypothyroidism, like most patients with hypothyroidism in general, do better on a T4, T3 combination or a desiccated uh, thyroid combination. Desiccated thyroid has T4 and T3 in it. The common brands are Armour, MP Thyroid, Athesa, 
Um, and these patients, most patients with hypoperthyroidism do better on the desiccated thyroid or T4, T3. One of the reasons is growth hormone deficiency can lead to impaired T4 and T3 conversion. So therefore giving the sub T3 along with the T4 or desiccated thyroid is as helpful. And then once you treat with growth hormone, you can decrease your free T4 and you can unmask central hypothyroidism. Um, so I do recommend treating people with central hypothyroidism to get the full benefits of its growth hormone deficiency or treatment. Now, this is very important that thyroid hormone increases cortisol breakdown. And you can put somebody in adrenal crisis if you start their thyroid medicine before you address adrenal insufficiency. Um, and this is, uh, I think, overblown by some people. They, they, uh, there's some support groups that say everybody with thyroid dis deficiency should get uh, their adrenal supported and adrenal medicine. That's not really true. You have to have fairly significant adrenal insufficiency before it's affected. But if you do have pretty severe adrenal insufficiency, you need to start the cortisol first before your thyroid medicine. When I treat central hypothyroidism, I aim for the free T4 in the upper range of normal. TSH will be suppressed. A lot of doctors don't understand why the TSH is suppressed and say they need to go on less medicine. That's not really true. You really you don't need to look at the TSH um, most of the time in patients after starting the treatment. You're looking for that free T4 in that upper normal range of like 1.5 or 1.7. Patients with both hypothyroidism, both primary and central hypothyroidism, should especially be monitored with a free T4 and not the TSH measurement. We'll switch to growth hormone deficiency. There are more than 50,000 adults in the United States with growth hormone deficiency. Uh, patients with hypoteroidism have increased mortality, which is thought to be due to the growth hormone deficiency. Growth hormone deficiency in adults results in decreased bone formation or osteoporosis, increased fat mass, decreased muscle mass, lipid abnormalities, increased uh, thickness of blood vessels, increased inflammatory markers, impaired quality of life, increased number of sick days, impaired exercise tolerance. And the good news is most of these abnormalities are corrected by treatment. If left on diagnosis, adult growth hormone deficiency can lead to premature mortality, dying early, or morbidity, multiple signs and symptoms, including body fat increase, muscle, decreased muscle mass, fatigue and weakness, osteoporosis, increased rate of fractures, bad cholesterol, heart disease, increased impaired physiological well-being, such as isolation, anxiety, or depression. So this shows some of the mechanisms involved with the growth hormone deficiency, leads to central obesity, lipid problems, glucose problems, oxidative stress, pro-inflammatory cytokines, endothelial dysfunction. These all lead to increased cardiovascular mortality and um, cardiovascular and heart and brain morbidity. Growth hormone itself is not pulsatile, is pulsatile, so you can't measure just a random growth hormone because you'd be at the top of the pulse or the bottom of the pulse. So you can tell a really a, a true endocrinologist, they would not measure a random growth hormone, um, but they would look at the IGF-1. So what we do is we screen with the IGF-1. If it's in the top 50% for, for age and sex, like greater than 150, growth hormone deficiency is less likely. The Z-score would be a plus number. If they have a empty cell, a history of head trauma, headaches, and low blood pressure after delivery, such as Sheehan syndrome, history of pituitary surgery or radiation or pituitary tumor, growth hormone is more likely. And if their if their growth hormone is less than if their IGF one is less than seventy five, it is quite likely they may need a stim test for insurance purposes. But they have a pretty good chance of having growth hormone deficiency. If they're in the no, lower range of the IGF one, so sort of like you know about one hundred twenty five, nine hundred to one hundred twenty five, uh, then it's worth doing a stimulation test. Uh, the growth hormone stimulation test is preferred. I'll talk about that in one of the next slides. Um, the cutoff is three. Um, I occasionally would give somebody five if they have very low IGF-1 and problems, but I think three is a regional choice. In the insulin tolerance test, which I don't do, a cutoff of growth hormone is five. Some people are advocating a cutoff of one in patients with obesity. I don't think that's really fair because I think the growth hormone deficiency leads to the obesity and not the other way around. And I don't think um, the people should be penalized because they're overweight because most of the people with growth hormone deficiency are. Um, there is the macular stimulation test, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, I was using it for a while, but the problem is the macular is like $5,000 and most insurance companies don't cover it. And the, the company that makes the macular used to have a support group that helped you get it covered and now they don't. So it's very hard to get this covered. This shows about the IGF-1. The IGF-1 can be in people with growth hormone deficiency. It's often low, but it's often in the normal range. 
Um, it's a good measure of integrated secretion. However, it overlaps with, uh, between normal subjects and growth hormone deficient subjects. It decreases with age, as you can see here, and it's a little bit lower in people that are obese, as you can see here also. So you do have the insulin tolerance test. It's two hour test, it's six blood draws, it's intensive, should not be used in patients that are older who have heart disease, uh, history of strokes. You can get low blood sugar, seizures, loss of consciousness, delayed hypoglycemia, has a lot of problems with it. The glucose, glucose stimulation test is what we do. It's intramuscular, it's nine blood draws, so it's a fair amount, it's four hours. Um, it doesn't need much supervision, but it is done in our office. Um, side effects include nauseous, vomiting, headaches, hypoglycemia, but these are pretty rare. And the Macrolin test is an oral test. It's 1.5 hours, so it's in four hour blood draws, so it's, it's, it's better, um, no contraindications, but it's just that it's really expensive and most insurances don't cover it. So we end up doing the middle column, the glucagon test. Um, so Macrolin's hard to obtain. We offer the glucagon test on both Tuesday night and some Sunday afternoons when Dr. Zucker run isn't, doesn't go skiing. So in the winter, you're less likely to get it on a Sunday than the summer. Uh, many centers have stopped doing growth hormone simulation tests. They used to have a list of other doctors that did it. Many of these doctors don't do it anymore with COVID. Um, patients should fast for eight hours before the test. And uh, if you're a new patient, you can come on a, a Tuesday night that we have in-person clinics the last Tuesday of each month to do the growth hormone and the um, and have your appointment. So um, I think most endocrinologists also don't, don't understand this. So what would you, who should you treat patients with growth hormone deficiency, mild growth hormone deficiency, or patients with mild cortisol deficiency? Uh, people seem to say that you shouldn't treat mild growth hormone deficiency. I think you should. The benefits of treating growth hormone deficiencies helps with symptoms, including fatigue, poor sleep, joint pain, psychological issues. It helps with bone density, body composition, carotidentimal thickness, your blood vessels that go to your brain, cardiovascular markers and lipids. It's easy to taper off or stop if you don't need it. The side effect is mainly joint pains and swelling. Mild cortisol insufficiency, you may present a crisis, but most people with mild don't have a crisis. It may help with fatigue, joint pain, abdominal pain, but may not. Um, it shuts down the adrenals from working. So it makes it very hard to stop or taper off. The body isn't making their own cortisol. They're making their own cortisol it has a lot of benefits as we talked about. The body knows how to make cortisol the right time and the right day. You get weight gain, diabetes, infections, and uh, hard to stop. Um, so for all these reasons, I think it's more important to treat mild growth hormone deficiency than mild cortisol deficiency. Um, in the children, you adjust for body weight. You don't need to do that in adults. Um, in general, we'll talk about this more also that oral but not transdermal estrogens inhibit the action of growth hormone at the liver. This leads to higher growth hormone and lower IGF-1 levels, both are a bad combination. In general, women need a higher dose than men. I started 0.4 milligrams per day. You should give it at night. In women, 0.2 milligrams per night in men. The final dose varies widely. You can't predict it, but you want to measure IGF-1 every couple months. Aim for an IGF-1 in sort of the upper normal range for age and gender, as long as they don't have side effects. Again, the side effects are usually often hand pain, swelling, um, carpal tunnel-like symptoms. Um, so you usually sort of aim for like in the 200s for most people. Um, you may not see an improvement in symptoms until you're at the sweet spot of this range. So oral estrogens and birth control pills stop growth hormone the liver. They raise growth hormone, which is more likely to give you diabetes and drop the IGF-1. If you want to try to overcome it, you sort of can. You can try to give, you have to give it two or three times the amount of growth hormone. You have side, more side effects from it. I really don't, I recommend this is the one drug people should not take if they're growth hormone deficient. And most patients with hypermaturities and growth, growth hormone deficient, they should not take birth control pills or oral estrogens. Uh, growth hormone is covered. Uh, um, growth hormone is the best treatment. It's covered by insurance. The problem is there's just severe shortages now, and Judy works really hard to try to find a source for people for growth hormone. The insurance play this game that they have a preferred brand, but they were out of the brand. So they, they say switch to another brand, but they don't cover it. Um, so uh, there's a lot of uh, problems with it now. Um, one choice is to cash pay. There's a medicine called Zomactin. We can either get it from University Compounding Pharmacy or Ocean Breeze Pharmacy. It's about $100 uh, for five milligrams. If you're on sort of a standard dose 0.4, it's about $250 a month, which is fairly reasonable for most people. Um, there's a different amino acid blends. I like Otropin from Orenda. Every store is the pituitary is delivered by lysosomes. It's $48 a month. There's Cerevital from uh, Costco or Cerevital.com, $94 for a 40-day supply. Um, so these are all good options. So there is a new long-acting growth hormone analog 
It was approved by the FDA called Somapacitan or Sogroya. It's made by Nova Nordis, the same country, the company that makes Ozempic. Um, it's approved for uh, by the FDA for ad adult growth hormone deficiency. Um, and it was uh, made available, was approved in 2022, 2020, but made available in 2023 in April for patients with adult growth hormone deficiency. It's a long acting human growth hormone derivative to which a small non covalent albumin bound binding moiety is attached to facilitate reversal of binding to endogenous albumin, delaying its elimination, thereby extending its duration of action with little or no accumulation of the drug when administered once weekly. In a phase three, 26 week randomized control pot trial with 96 adults with growth hormone deficiency treated, treated with soma pacitin or a daily or nortotropin. Soma pacitin is the weekly. It was well tolerated. IGF 1 was similar to the um, weekly, to the daily dose. And uh, most patients referred the weekly dose. With the uh, growth hormone deficiencies uh, shortages, Sagroya so is a good option. I take the daily dose and multiply by seven to give the weekly dose. It comes in a pen. It's pretty easy to give. The pictures are down at the bottom there. We'll talk about diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is a posterior hormone. The hormone is also called ADH or AVP. Symptoms are increased uh, urination and thirst. And I think mild cases are probably common, underdiagnosed and worthy treatment. These people have to go to the bathroom constantly. They have to wake up at night to go to the bathroom at night. That leads to poor sleep. And then people with poor sleep gain weight, have worse diabetes and things like that. It may lead to bladder and kidney problems. So if you wake up, you know, several times a night and you're not, uh, don't have a urological problem, it's something to consider if you have hypopituitarism. I usually have people collect a 24 hour urine for a volume, a volume greater than three liters makes it likely. And then I have them have a 12 hour fast with no water, no food. Many people don't understand this and they drink, they don't eat. I collect an 8 a.m. serum and urine osmolality. If their serum osmolality should be greater than 300 or the urine osmolality is less than 500, they have, they're considered having that. Um, they often have a low AVP, but normal people can have a low AVP as well. So I measure it, but the really the urine osmolality 500 or 600 is really the best cutoff. Um, it used to do a test called a formal water deprivation test. They bring them to the hospital. You might as well just do this test here. That's not really needed. Um, I usually give DDAV pills. Some people give the nasal sprays. I don't find they work as well. Um, most of the DDAVP should be given at night. You should have a breakthrough urination in the next day in the evening. Pretty benign treatment. It may have a lot of benefits. And the AVP itself may have some benefits in terms of sense of well-being. So I think this is also something that's undertreated and um, um, should be done with more patients. We'll talk about my favorite hormone, oxytocin. Oxytocin is the love hormone. It's made by the posterior pituitary like AVP. Um, it's not tested or properly re replaced in most people. It may have a role in bonding, intimacy, orgasm, GI issues, trust, generosity, pain, and, and energy. A lot of patients with um, hypopituitarism have these problems. There is an assay at uh, for a 24-hour urine oxytocin assay at Rooney Valley Labs in Washington State. I'm not that convinced the assay is that great, but I think it's fairly good. And uh, I do have patients usually get the 24-hour uh, urine level. And if it's low, we would replace you. It's available from University Compounding Pharmacy, which is the compounding pharmacy I use frequently in San Diego and other places. Um, it's either sublingual troches or a nasal spray. And patients have an improvement with it. Most of my patients do feel better on it. So they like it. Um, they're willing to pay. It could be like $100 a month. You get some weight loss. You get less joint pains. I've seen patients have more cortisol requirements. It seems like it's the main side effect. And we can give patients this if they're established patient. Um, if they're not established patient, I can see them and put, test them and put them on this. Uh, but this may be an important thing to improve quality of life. We'll talk about gonadotropins or L the GNRH LH FSH access, which controls testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. Symptoms of this are lack of ovulation, irregular no periods, hot flashes, poor sleep, infertility, vaginal dryness, osteoporosis, or thin bones, decreased libido, and poor sense of well being. Again, these are common symptoms in patients with uh, hypopituitarism. These can be quite uh, detrimental. Um, if you do have this, if you're trying to get pregnant, you want to see if you ovulate, you see a reproductive endocrinologist, um, they can easily get people pregnant on this that I can't. Um, um, so that would be a way to go if you're trying to get pregnant. If you're not trying to get pregnant, I usually replace estrogen. If you have a uterus in place, I you replace progesterone. Um, 
I'm finding that many people still benefit from with progesterone even without a uterus. Um, there are, I'll talk about the next slide, but there is, you know, people usually sleep better and feel a little more relaxed and their hot flashes can be better on estrogen plus progesterone, even without a uterus. And testosterone, we'll talk about that. It's very helpful. People with low libido and muscle strength with women with low libido and muscle strength. Um, so irregular signs may be an early sign of pituitary dysfunction. People have, um, you know, come to doctors with, uh, that is one of the first symptoms. Um, there was famous studies, the Women's Health Initiative, her studies, they took postmenopausal women who are not on estrogen. The Women's Health Initiative was the average age was 63. So it's an older crowd um, that had some problems with uh, both breast cancer and blood clots. And, a, and that it also used Premarin, which is an old fashioned um, estrogen preparation. Um, you know, nowadays, I think uh, we're replacing people with transdermal estrogen. It's better, it's safer. Younger patients are especially likely to benefit from it than people are and certainly premier, you know, less than menopausal age with hyperpituitism should definitely be on this. Menopausal women should can also be on it. Um, they usually feel better. They might need a little higher dose um, if then you have postmenopausal women. Less clear if um, you're an older person how much you need it, but I have some patients in their 60s and so, and they still want to stay on estrogen, which is reasonable. Uh, you can have a period or you cannot based on the age or patient's age and preference. Younger people, I usually recommend the period. Some of the choices include the Premarin, which is really people don't use anymore. Pre Premarin stands for pregnant mere urine. It's a conjugate estrogen, has multiple estrogen properties, oral estrogen compounds uh, such as estrates, birth control pills. I don't recommend them. Uh, as I mentioned with the growth hormone deficiency, they have high dose of progesterone, low dose of estrogen. That's a bad combination. I like the estrogen patches, the bigger patches called a chimera patch is a, a generic one. Um, the viable patch is a smaller one. I like that one a lot. It's very easy to put on. Estrogel is a cream that's really good. You can do vaginal estrogens that don't quite have the same systemic effects, but they're helpful for local effects. Femring, estring, and there's a lot of compounded estrogens. Sometimes I use this, but I usually like the, the, um, the vivel or the estrogel better. Um, the compounded estrogens can be cream, sublingual drops or pills. Um, oral estrogens, um, you want to avoid um, oral estrogens, block the action, of, they go through the liver, they act, block the actions of growth hormone with the liver to raise IGF-1, it leads to high growth hormone and low IGF-1, both of them are bad. It raises sex hormone binding globulin, it raises total testosterone, but decreases free testosterone, the low free testosterone, which is the active hormone, may lead to decreased libido and low energy and decreased muscle mass. So that's a lot of different, definitely a detriment of oral estrogens and birth control pills. Oral estrogens and birth control pills decrease free testosterone for even a year after stopping it. So these are you know, pretty detrimental things that affect a, a important hormone called testosterone. If you have high testosterone, they could be helpful, but for people with hypothyroidism with low testosterone, I would really try to stay away from them. Um, the oral estrogens, but not transdermal estrogens, raise your thyroid binding globulin. It can make an increase in thyroid hormone requirements. It raises your cortisol binding globulin, um, at least a high level of total cortisol, but lower levels of free cortisol. Makes testing for adrenal insufficiency def dif difficult. So again, oral estrogens, birth control pills, if you're on growth hormone deficiency, I would probably not avoid it. What type of estrogen is best? Uh, estradiol is the bioidentical, the most abundant. The bio ovaries also make estrone, E1, estradiol E2, and estradiol E3. Um, there's slight evidence that estrone is detrimental for breast cancer. Um, estradiol is probably okay. Um, but um, most of the body makes is estradiol, and I don't see really any reason to give other estrogens beside that. Um, some compounding pharmacies incurring bias, which is estradiol or estriol. Triest, I don't really see much advantage of that. I usually try to give the, the Vivor or the estrogel, again, transdermal, not oral, titrate dose of the estradiols in the upper range of normal, such as uh, 50 to 100. Um, young patients should be on uh, the estrogen, um, you know, about daily, but should be on a patch or so. Um, if you take uh, Provera, five to 10 milligrams for 10 days, the type of stop, and you'll, this will usually induce a period progesterone or promethium, 100 to 200 milligrams will induce a period. If you take a lower dose of Provera, often a daily dose of promethium, 100 milligrams, you usually won't get a period. Um, and, um, you know, the people that are younger, 40 to 45 year old woman, I try to give them a period. The people that are older, many of them don't want a period. 
it's an individualized issue. Uh, people with uh, women with intact uterus should take progesterone. Sometimes people with um, allergies should take progesterone. Progesterone may help with sleep, hot flashes, but could give fatigue and bloating. But I don't see that that much with a bioidentical progesterone or prometrium. Okay, we'll talk about testosterone for women. I did uh, some research on this. Um, previous studies of testosterone supplementation in surgical or naturally menopausal women have shown improvements in subjective measures of sexual function, sense of well being, and variable changes in the markers of bone formation. So they may help in these issues. Androgen supplementation uh, is likely or can potentially improve sexual function, improve bone density, improve muscle mass and function, improve mood and sense of well being improve cognitive function, help with autoimmune disease, help with premenstrual syndrome, improve and dry eye syndrome. So it's a lot of things it could do, um, not as much data on it, but many, I think most of the time, uh, androgens are helpful. Um, side effects would be virilization, you know, extra acne, facial hair, um, effect on plasma lipids, effect on behavior. Um, so these are some of the detrimental effects. Uh, patients with hypopterogism have increased mortality. Some of this may be due to growth hormones. Some of it may be due to low testosterone. Uh, Hypopterogism, including some work that we're doing. These is from is poor quality of life, obesity, decreased libido, thin bones. And these persist in spite of standard hormone replacement. So women with hypopterogism have severe antigen de de deficiencies. Uh, Karen Miller published this uh, in 2001. They have de uh, impairment of both adrenal and ovarian source of androgen production. They have lower testosterone and lower DHCS levels than women with ovarian failure alone. So I recommend measuring the bioavailable and total testosterone in women with hypopetrogism. If the bioavailable testosterone is less than two, the free testosterone is not that accurate in women at lower levels. So I usually don't measure, look at that that much. I recommend a testosterone cream from a compounding pharmacy. In younger women, I would use the 2.5 milligrams per mil, one mil daily dose. In older women, I might use 1.25 milligrams per mil, one mil daily. Side effects would be facial hair, acne, or hair loss. Usually works fairly well. The compounding pharmacies I work with are quite good. You can give subcutaneous shots. The dose is tricky because it's, it's a very low dose, um, but it's much cheaper. Um, and I aim for a bioavailable testosterone in the three to seven range. What about DHEA? Um, you give DHEA, you measure DHEAS. The measured DHEA is not that accurate. It's an adrenal androgen made by the adrenals. Well, the um, testosterone is made by the ovaries for the most part. Um, it's low in hypopituitarism. Um, a dose of 10 to 25 milligrams may help with energy. Um, the side effects are fairly common, include oily skin and greasy hair. And I find that giving testosterone is more helpful than giving DHEA. DHEA can get converted to testosterone, but has a more narrow window of the benefit of the testosterone is helpful in more people. I'm going to close by talking about a very important topic, apathetic depression, hypothyroidism. This was a very important article that came out in 2005 in Journal of Neuropsychiatry Psychiatry and Clinical Neurosciences. Apathy and pituitary disease, it has nothing to do with depression. Increasingly, patients with pituitary disease are evaluated and treated at cancer centers. In many ways, these patients resemble patients with other malignant brain tumors. Although the majority of pituitary adenomas are benign, the physical, emotional, and cognitive changes that these patients experience on their well being is malignant. Pituitary disease causes a variety of physical illness resulting from alteration of the hypothalamic pituitary end work and access. In addition, patients with pituitary disease may experience many emotional problems, including depression, anxiety, behavioral disturbances, and personality changes. And above and beyond that many reactions, these patients may have to a myriad of adjustments that they make during their lives. A growing understanding that pituitary patients may experience these emotional problems as a result of long-term effects at the pituitary tumor itself, treatment and or hormone changes have on the hypothalamic end access. Uh, the authors present a series of cases. They talk about the diagnosis and how to improve this. So I think this is a real condition. I think this is quite common and is underdiagnosed and underappreciated. So apathy means no interest in life's pleasure. That's a, a common problem. I think most patients have this. You wonder about patients with multiple head concussions. Each head concussion affects their pituitary axis. Uh, Junior Seo played for the San Diego Chargers, uh, committed suicide. Um, uh, potentially because of his having, um, you know, these uh, hormonal issues related to uh, this apathy or depression. Uh, there was a player from um, my current, a player for the Broncos, also uh, committed suicide. 
Um, these patients respond to stimulants, not antidepressants. I like to give Ritalin LA 20 milligrams in the morning. Um, it helps with important things that these patients with pituitary problems are missing, energy, focus, weight loss. I really think it's a great medicine for people. Um, you can, uh, the side effects include hyper insomnia and anxiety. I find it's very easy to stop. It's not very rarely as an addicting medicine that you have to taper off. Most people can stop it if they don't like it. Um, I think most patients should be on these medicines. I think they're helpful. They work well with growth hormone and oxytocin. Uh, in terms of hormone interactions, there's a lot of hormone interactions. I think that's why you need to frequently monitor and test and uh, adjust. Um, if you treat um, adrenal insufficiency and hypothyroidism with thyroid hormone, Without the cortisol, it increases the breakdown of cortisol. It may lead to an adrenal crisis. Thyroid hormone also increases the breakdown of other hormones, growth hormone, testosterone. If you go up your thyroid, you may need more growth hormone. You may need more testosterone. Treating with growth hormone increase the T4 to T3 conversion. You may need less T3 if you're already on the uh, on you're on a T3 preparation or desiccated thyroid. Treating with growth hormone may decrease TSH. This may make your hypothyroidism worse. You have some TSH and it goes down with growth hormone. You may need a higher dose of thyroid hormone once growth hormone is started. Oral but not transdermal estrogens increase the need for levothyroxine and women with hypothyroidism. Um, so therefore, another reason not to use oral est estrogens. Oral but not transdermal estrogens increase the need for growth hormone replacement. Stopping oral estrogens leads to an elevated IGF-1. You can get hand swelling commonly. Patients on growth hormone replacement should not be on oral estrogens that we talked about before. And treating adrenal insufficiency may unmask diabetes insipidus. So you can get worse diabetes insipidus when you treat someone with cortisol, and that has to be addressed. Um, increased growth hormone in IGF-1 leads to lower levels of cortisol because of the enzyme 11 beta hd one Therefore, if you have a person with hypothyroidism with growth hormone, they may get worse uh, cortisol levels and adrenal insufficiency issues. So I had a famous patient um, that was over-replaced on glucocorticoids, under-replaced on thyroid hormones, not treated with growth hormone. I thought I did a great job with her. I started on growth hormone, cut down her glucocorticoids, increased her thyroid medicine, did all this at once. A couple of weeks later, she went into the adrenal crisis. The moral of the story is make changes slow, monitor frequently, and see a specialist that can really understand pituitary hormones. So what's the problem? Patients are on too much cortisol. Some people don't even need cortisol. You can taper them off of it. They're not on enough thyroid medicine. They're not on the right thyroid medicine, including some that has T3 in it. They're not on growth hormone. They're not on testosterone. Um, they're not on stimulants. They're not on oxytocin. This leads to fatigue, weight gain, and depression. So get your doses adjusted and see an expert. So I think I'm an expert at this. So hopefully I convinced everybody of that. Um, if you are um, a new patient, please make us, I'm happy to see you. If you know people that would benefit from my expertise, please make sure they um, um, refer them to me. Uh, we'll post this on um, goodhormonehealth.com the next couple of, couple of days, and um, we'll um, have some time for questions now. Um, uh, <clears throat> I so have some uh, Facebook some... questions. Okay. Um, Phoebe says if taking nuvering for estrogen and having withdrawal bleach, should you still supplement progesterone? Um. I don't use much nuvering, but I think it could, you probably do it if you're having withdrawal bleeding and, um, you know, it's uncontrollable. You probably should go on progesterone. You should get your uterine lining measured. It's, um, um, it should be, there's a cutoff of five millimeters and it's bigger than, thicker than five millimeters. You probably should go on progesterone. Mm -hmm. Um, do you recommend DHEA and testosterone together or testosterone alone? I usually recommend to start with testosterone alone. I think testosterone is more likely to be beneficial, especially with people with low testosterone. Um, and then I would add um, a lower dose of DHEA, 10 to 25 milligrams, if their DHEA is low, DHEA is low, and then um, we can um, see how they do on that. Um, but I find the testosterone is more important than the DHEA. Um, the DHEA is over the counter, so it's a little easier to give, but I find that it has a more a higher risk of side effects. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tiffany asks, would someone with AGHD be considered hypopit? And if so, should they talk to their endo about switching from Zoloft to a stimulant for depression? Um, you know, I think they could. Um, so the, the more access you have, 
um, that your defects, the more likely I think you are to have hypopituitarism. And if you have this pituitary apathy, you know, you just don't feel like doing anything all day, um, you're, you're lethargic. I think being on a stimulant would be a good choice. And you can talk to your doctor and especially if the um, typical antidepressants don't work, I think switching over is good. Great. Tyler asks, can you work with patients in Europe? Sure. So we can do um, um, FaceTime appointments or Zoom Zoom appointments. I would say Zoom appointments for people Hello. in Europe and um, happy to see them there. Okay. Uh, Melody okay, I, asks, do get, I do get patients from all around the world. So. Right. <clears throat> Melody asks, what can be done about increased heart rate on Ritalin? Uh, probably cutting down the dose. Um and, um, you know, there's a sort of a range of doses. I usually start with 20, but 10 might be enough for somebody. And um, if you have high heart rate, I find that magnesium glyconate helps with high heart rate. Low, low iron is, makes heart rate worse. So replacing iron can help. Okay. Jason asks, pan hypo used to brain tumor had adverse side effects every time tried growth hormone, fractured growth plate of hip, high blood sugar, and carpal tunnel and blurry vision. Any thoughts on this? So potentially you could try a real low dose and work your way up. A lot of people need to um, titrate up, um, you know, so you can start with like 0.1 milligram or even less and work your way up. Um, you know, not everybody can benefit from it, but um, I think if you start low and work up slowly, you could have a good benefit from it. Great. Lisa asks, is IUD birth control okay uh, when testing for pituitary issues? So IUDs are pretty safe. They don't interact with your hormones. Um, you know, some of them have progesterone in them, which is also not so bad. Um, so I think the IUDs are a much better way to go for contraception than oral contraceptives are. Um, so I mm -hmm. think they're a good choice. Danielle asks, would taking semi-glutide injection impact a glucogen stimulation test for AGHD? No. So um, a glucagon test. Um, so uh, Zempic or semaglutide um, really doesn't affect your growth hormones. So you can keep taking it even if you're uh, going for a growth hormone stim test. Okay, great. Betsy says, what is an alternative to Ritalin if you can't tolerate that? Um, a lower dose. Um, there are other stimulants, Adderall. Some people work. I like the Ritalin better than Adderall. I think more people use Adderall nowadays. Um, you know, I'm an endocrinologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. Some people will benefit mm -hmm. from seeing a psychiatrist who has more expertise on that. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> Cheryl asks, how different is MacRelin from ITT testing? Um, so they're quite different. ITT, you get hypoglycemic. It has to be done in a doctor's office. You don't want to do it in people's heart's problem. It has to be monitored completely. It's a lot of blood tests. The Macrolin test is oral. Um, it doesn't have many side effects. It's just getting the Macrolin covered is uh, expensive okay. and hard to get covered. Mm -hmm. Gina asks, would you recommend Provigil 200 milligrams in place of Ritalin if Provigil... No. Okay. Yeah, if, go ahead. If Provigil, what? Right. If Provid is Provigil acceptable with treatment with T3 and T4 in patients with central hypotuitarism? I don't find that Provigil works at all in people. I think it's um, so weak, weak choice. I think the, the actual stimulants mm -hmm. are better. Melody asks, what can I do if you can't prescribe in my state and your pharmacies don't cover my state and my local endocrinologist won't acknowledge the need for hormone replacement? I guess move. <laughs> That's a good idea. Okay. okay. Janet asks, I am pan hypo pitu isha, pituitary, I think, with low blood glucose verified by CGM and two hour insulin tolerant tests. Could this be from too little cortisol replacement? Is it suspected I have insulinoma by Dr. Ewan? Right. I don't think you have an insulin one. Well, sure you don't. Um, and, um, you know, it could be low um, low growth hormone or low cortisol. Both of them can give you uh, hypoglycemia. Okay. Um, just a couple more on Facebook. Um, let's see. Do you want to read some of them on Zoom? Um, yeah. On let's Zoom? see some on Zoom and then we'll can get back them? to them. Yeah, I can see all of them. Yeah. Um, so Tony, Tom asks, says, awesome doctor, could hypolipidemia lead to low cortisol, low testosterone, estrogen, or low free 
or low free T4, let's say LDL at 35 milligrams total at 100 milligrams DL? Uh, probably not. Um, you do need cortisol to make um, adrenal hormones, but I think you don't need that much. So I would say it's unlikely. Okay. Um, Jason asks, what other stimulants are good besides Ritalin? You know, I like Ritalin the best, but Adderall is another choice. Mm -hmm. Karen asks, can you talk about the risks of GH replacement with a history of cancer? That's a good question. So growth hormone can increase your risk of cancer. So I think if somebody certainly has active cancer, I would never give it. If somebody has a distant history and they're sort of cleared by their oncologist, um, then that's probably okay. Okay. Shireen asks, 50 years menopause and will start estrogen patch and progesterone tab. Would that mean I will get a period again? No. So if you take um, progesterone, you cycle it, you take it for 11 days a month or so, you would get a period. If you take it continuous, you, sh you should not get a period. Mm -hmm. Katie asks, currently, I think only one growth hormone drug doesn't need refrigeration. Do you think other companies will make this kind of drug in the near future? It's so much more convenient. Um, so she's talking about genotropin, which I agree yeah. is more convenient. However, I think companies are making less growth hormone. Um, the price has gone down. Their profitability is less. Um, you know, there's um, places that we talked about, the Zomactin that you can get from compounding pharmacies that are much less expensive. So I think the companies are doing less. You know, the companies that make... Um, um, Nord Nova Nordis makes growth hormone, but they also make Ozempic. Uh, Lilly makes um, um, Manjuro. They make growth hormones. So these companies, I think, are seeing uh, other areas that they're going to make more money in. Um, so I don't think they're going to you're going to get that many new companies. Um, I do think the um, the once a week one is very promising, and that might be um, uh, easier to take. And you know, if you unless you go on a long trip, you know, if you mm -hmm. a short trip, you just keep it refrigerated and go away for three or four days or five, you know, five or six days, even and you'll be okay. Right. Dane asks, can you talk about the risks, if any, of starting and stopping growth hormone? No, so I think it's quite pretty safe. Um, you can, I don't know why, why you would need to stop it, but for some reason, if you, if they run out, for example, there's a shortage, you have to stop it. Um, you'll feel lousy, but you'll probably, um, um, you'll probably be okay if you restart it again. Mm-hmm. Okay, Teresa asks, is it possible to have a deficiency in only oxytocin and AGH? Uh, yes, so the different uh, oxy, um, growth hormones, the first one to be affected. Oxytocin might be fairly, uh, people don't study that much, might be fairly early. So it's possible to have them both. Mm -hmm. Okay, how would a patient on five milligrams progesterone transition onto hydrocortisone and avoid having symptoms of adrenal crisis withdrawal extreme weakness slash joint pain. So, you know, five milligrams of prednisone is somewhere about 20 to 25 milligrams of hydrocortisone. So I would split it up into, um, you know, maybe 22.5 a day or 25 a day of hydrocortisone uh, with most in the morning and throughout the day and then cut, start tapering down. Awesome. Okay. Tammy from Facebook says, how helpful would Ritalin be for a patient 62 on... Four TEF, 10, 5, 5, 2.5 daily. Um, it's pretty specific. <laughs> Levothyroxine um, uh, and lithiorhinin and bioidentical cream of biased testosterone, DHEA, and progesterone treatment has been over 10 years, but apathy is a daily struggle. I think we're alone be great. Um, you know, maybe okay. in someone who's 62, you might start with a lower dose, 10 milligrams or five milligrams. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jason asks, can you have a normal or low fasting thyroid labs before meds and still be hyper or over medicated? Normal or low fasting mm -hmm. thyroid labs? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe he's referring to TSH. Um, I don't know. So, you know, you want to look at your thyroid labs and if they're free T4 and free T3 are high. Um, often, you know, as I mentioned, patients with hypopituitarism have a low TSH, so I wouldn't worry about that. But if your free T4 and free T3 are high, you're probably overtreated. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a couple more questions. Um, is it normal for your TSH to go up and down or should it always be the same levels? So it does go up and down. It's up and down different times of the day and different times of the year. It's usually higher in the winter than the summer, for example. So it can vary some, um, you know, then 
potentially if people are adding different medicines that cause the thyroid to, to you know, be not absorbed or break down, um, if they start taking the, their thyroid with different medicines or foods, um, it can vary some. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, is it normal that my prolactin went up as I went on a higher doses of Manjuro? Did it slow? Does it slower the digestion of cabergoline? Is apathy from pituitary tumor or cabergoline? Um, I don't think uh, Ozempic affects cabergoline levels. Um, haven't people haven't really looked at that that much? Um, I think if your prolactin is high, you can go more cabergoline. And I think the apathy is not from the cabergoline, but from the pituitary issues. Okay, just take two more questions. Um, <clears throat> lots of questions. Uh, let, Preston asks, I read some information online that suggested that macrolin test is going to become unavailable in the U.S. Do you have any information on this? Um, I don't, but I think the company is not really behind it too much because they're not really putting much effort into it. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Katie asks, looks like somapacitin has a lot of common side effects, including waking. How common do you think the side effects actually are? Um, yes, yeah, so that's the long acting growth hormone. I think they're similar to regular growth hormone. I think they're having pretty good growth. Uh, waking is rare. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is Shanna asks, is there a way to test cortisol cortisol replacement is right through labs instead of just guessing based on symptoms? Yeah. So I would do the 24-hour urine for the 17 hydroxy steroids. Okay. Could Amy ask, could my daughter Ariel have Sheehan from her hemorrhage after a tummy tuck post pituitary cushings, or can it only be caused by delivery? Um I, I think that's the other one. The um, Simmons syndrome is not after delivery, so people can have it um, at other times. Um, I think it's more common after delivery. She should come see me. Yeah. Claire asks, why do endos and GPS know so little about she hands no proper treatment? Um, I mean, primary is certainly not expect to know it because it's not that common. And most uh, endocrinologists, you know, do diabetes or thyroid or um, you know, I think that's why I'm, a, I'm more of an expert and that's why people should come see me. Right. Okay. One more question and then we're going to wrap it up. Mm -hmm. Um, Jason asks, my PCP says to testosterone level is normal and not contributing to my high levels of high hematrocyt and red blood cells continue on my question. Would the en endocrine men's increase the, the blood values? Um, you know, so you want to look at the free testosterone if that's high, um, I would probably cut down on your um, replacement. Um, mm -hmm. you know, if, um... Okay. One more question. Why do you use 17 hour urine versus 24 hour urine? No, it's 17 hydroxy steroid in a 24 hour. Oh. Urine. Okay. And he asked, why would you use the 17 hydroxy steroids? Yeah. Because uh -huh. they're more integrated of cortisol throughout the day. Um, when you take the, when you use this urinary free cortisol, which is another measure in the urine, it's mostly re related to the first dose of the cortisol, but the 17 hydroxy steroids are throughout the whole day. Mm -hmm. All right, Dr. Freeman. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. For everyone Hope else whose questions we didn't get answered, um, please make an appointment with Dr. Freeman and he will answer all your questions and get you feeling perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Okay.